there are signs that can be present as early as four. The child who doesn't like to be read to, who doesn't like to hear nursery rhymes. For children that often have emotional disturbance or behavior or any number of reasons, they don't go to school, oftentimes the, really the underlying factor is reading. They can't read and so why should they go to school? It's just an embarrassing place for them. Dyslexia is a very misunderstood diagnosis. People think it's reading backwards, and it is not. Something like 85% of our prison population reads at a fourth grade reading level. If you don't read on grade level by third grade, you're two to three times more likely to be either incarcerated or be on federal assistance. One of the huge problems is that teachers did not recognize the problem and that's uh, still a problem today. And the school districts really didn't even speak of dyslexia. In fact, one school administrator said to us, we don't talk about that D word. I've worked in districts where 80% of the students were not reading on grade level. And that critical mass of students are destined to continue to struggle unless something happens. When a student struggles to learn to read, everyone in the family feels the pain. It's hard for the student, it's hard for the parent, because they, they really don't know what to do. And if we position children to be able to really engage in all aspects of literacy, it changes the family tree forever. Nyhouse Education Center affects that change, and our work starts with a three-part mission. The first is to train teachers to teach dyslexic students in Houston. The Nyhouse Center started out as a center to train teachers to teach children one-on-one -on -one to do private instruction. The goal was always to be primarily focused on providing teachers the information, the tools, the strategies for teaching someone who has dyslexia how to read and write and comprehend in an efficient way. In 1987, we had a large contract with HISD, Houston Independent School District, to train 47 special education teachers so that they would take this training back into the classroom and work with their students. So that's a huge shift from individual one-to-one -to, -one to group work in the public schools. School districts were starting to take notice. There's a great quote, I think it's Schmoker, who says, if you put a great teacher up against a weak system, the system wins every time. So a lot of the work that we do now is actually with building principals, superintendents, administrators, and that district level view. When we train the teachers, we are reaching a lot of children. We multiply our effect. By training a teacher every year, if she's in, say, a regular classroom of 25 students, then that's 25 students she's reaching. And, and say, the, say it's 10 to 20%, that means there's five children in her class that need this special training and the benefits of it. The second mission is to provide resources and information to parents of struggling readers and dyslexic students. From the beginning, we knew it was important that parents would have a resource. So we started offering parent seminars because they could do a lot at home. And they also needed to be very knowledgeable about what their students needed and about the whole field of dyslexia. I think that the Parent Support Office is a, a fabulous part of this organization because parents can call and have the ear of someone who knows exactly what they're going through in terms of learning for the first time that their child is dyslexic, and that can be a very frightening diagnosis. A lot of it just has to do with finding out what reading problems are, that it's not the end of the world. It's something that can be addressed, and so it's giving them hope and information. 
Lennox Reed always said our job is to give the parents a spine of steel so that they can go in and advocate for their children. I think we had over 3,000 phone calls last year from parents, just word of mouth calling here and coming to the library, coming to the seminars that we offer. Finally, Nyhouse provides direct instruction to dyslexic adults who want to improve their reading and spelling. A long time ago, dyslexia was not a recognized disability. And so these 40-year-old students, 50-year-old students are now facing the fact that they're not reading as well. They, they've known it all along. Some of them read quite poorly and they seek help and something comes up, such as their grandchildren they're trying to help with homework, you know, read the Bible with, whatever. I'm very happy to say that currently in the adult literacy classes that we still have, there is an individual that started with us in 1986 and he had to drop out because he had family obligations. In the meantime, he raised two wonderful children the older of his sons graduated from A&M as an engineer. When he got those children raised, he was able to come back to Nye House to work on his own reading, and he is making fabulous progress. So there's nothing quite like the dedication of an adult who knows the value of reading and decides to do something about that. The idea for the center began when a handful of Houston families, including the Nyhouses and Knowles, saw a great need. It began in 1978 when a group of parents whose children were dyslexic knew that to form a branch of the International Dyslexia Society, it was called Orton Society then, would bring together the different people who could work with these children, the teachers, the parents, and that if everyone came together, maybe we could figure out what needed to be done in Houston and what could be done. My mom and dad were gracious enough or strong enough to recognize that I had a learning problem. They championed one cause called the Orton Gilliam process in Houston, and with that, some other wonderful people joined in. The Collies, the Knowles, Freda Parker, Lennox Reed, all got involved, and Marilyn Beckwith. Once the opportunity came about, they formed the Nye House Education Center to help people with learning differences. It was a cause born out of very personal experience. My story is I got kicked out of the school early on, and they recognized that it was not my fault, so they were tenacious enough to continue to investigate what was going on. My, my IQ appeared to be good, so I applaud my mother and my father for not giving up on me. When my next older brother was in his early elementary school grades, he was having great difficulty with spelling, and my parents would work with him the night before, Thursday night for the Friday spelling test, and then Friday morning, he still couldn't spell them. And so they started talking to their friends and they ran into a friend uh, who said, uh, gee, that sounds like something our classmate from uh, Southern Methodist University, Aylett Cox, is working on in Dallas. So they sent my brother to Aylett Cox and the Scottish Rite Hospital for testing and analysis. And they said, well, he's dyslexic. When I started showing some signs of language difficulty, Lennox Reed had just completed her training at Scottish Rite with Aylett, and she had just moved to Houston, and so I ended up being Lennox Reed's first student. How could you not believe in the mission when you see your own child blossoming, your child who could not read, your child who is really slipping through the cracks at school? My parents hosted a meeting in their living room with Oscar and Betty, and. Virginia McFarland, uh, Nancy Colley, and others, Freda Parker, and of course, Lennox Reed, <laughs> to see about training teachers, providing the training here in Houston. When my dad passed away, the folks he had been working with for many years, the, the Cullen family, came to my mother and said, we'd like to honor Oscar. And we had this great idea. He loved to be involved in fire engines and 
You would go to and, and see fires. And we're going to talk to the Houston Fire Museum and maybe name the building after Oscar. Name it the Oscar Nyhouse Fire Museum. And my mother said, well, you know, that's a wonderful idea. You're right. He loved to chase fire engines. But I have a better idea. Let's put out fires by starting the Nyhouse Education Center. And so the Cullen Foundation agreed and, and hence gave us the, the seed money. At the center of the instruction was Lennox Reed. It was through her work with those students of parents who could afford to have their child worked with that the Nye House came to be. They wanted other parents to have the opportunities that their own children had. I don't think the center would exist without Lennox and her drive to get this, this organization off the ground and her unwillingness to give up and her determination that this was gonna succeed in a very lovely and understated way. She was really the epitome of what every teacher wanted to be. She just was so knowledgeable about the language and so eager to help teachers learn the language that it was really a pleasure to work with her. And as a director, she was so supportive. Lennox is a force of nature, but she is very much like a velvet steamroller. She is so lovely and so gracious and so committed and so passionate. So it's amazing to see. She is a very strong, tough, determined woman. And I think that, that she has carried this organization to get it where it is today. She's the underlying strength behind it. She's got it to a point where it is, it does stand its, on its own two feet. In the late 1970s and into the 80s, the founders stayed involved, new people were brought on board, and everyone played an important role. Founder Virginia Knoll was one example. She was marvelous. She raised money. Oh, she had thoughts coming out her ears. She was a very good businesswoman. Jolly to have, fun around. We all enjoyed each other. She was a lawyer. When she started having children, she did stop practicing law, devoted all of her energy to raising her family, and she helped draft the incorporating papers for the center and the foundation helped with those kinds of things and then she also helped on uh, fundraising trying to give encouragement and guidance. Particular heroes would be Betty and Oscar and I House for one. I knew Betty and Oscar they were Mr. and Mrs. Nye House to me. I was so fond of Oscar and Betty and then after Oscar died Betty's determination to see this center succeed was amazing. She was very involved. She came to every meeting. She came to every committee meeting. She had a network of friends who were the major donors to the organization at that time. Our president at the time was Nancy Colley and she was very particular and detailed and in a good way which made her a great leader, but it, it, it took a lot of time. But that just shows you the attention to detail and excellence that the founding board had for the Nye House Center. We were serious. It was a serious group, and we were very dedicated to our project. And we studied anything that had pertained to literature are reading, are learning. Virginia is a wonderful, kind, generous, what you think of as like the perfect grandmother. She's been involved longer than I've been involved, but I've known her since the very beginning, the very early days, and she so believed in what we do, and still does. It's still near and dear to her heart, and she will tell you that. 
And I've got another founder to tell you about that I really was crazy about is Freda Parker. Freda and I really clicked on a number of different levels. We just found people who could help us all along the way. When you have a good program and you believe in it and you're willing to go and tell them about it and sell them on it is even more far and farther, then you begin to get going. And it began to be well known here in Houston. And I was so proud to be a member of it. There were practical concerns, such as where the classes would be held. Lennox Reed had a good friend named Philip Cannon. He had an office building, a little office building over near Lamar High School, and they gave her a room or two to use. It really was interesting. For a while, I was interviewing candidates for our first class that was going to be in January of 1981 in my living room. I said to Mrs. Colley, I really think we should have an office. We had already rented the space for the class at St. Philip's Church. Let's look more professional. And then the next thing you knew, we needed more space, and so we moved to our place on West Alabama. And then within that year, we needed more space because we needed more space for classes. In that building, we soon spread out to 5,000 square feet in a few years. All of these things took money, of course. In the beginning, the center was established in memory of Oscar. And I think a lot of our donations were friends, friends of friends of the Nyehouse family. But then we grew, and so we became more widespread. We had to expand our funding. There were different ways we went, went about doing that, different, uh, let's say, fundraising campaigns fundraising pushes to involve the board, get the board more directly involved in fundraising, train them on making an ask, which is scary. We found a very warm reception when we opened our doors to our story and to our mission. And I think people saw the passion that our board and our staff had and they related to that too. At the dawn of the 1980s, a teaching staff was formed around a small core of professionals, beginning when Freda Parker and Marilyn Beckwith went for training in Dallas. So all of a sudden there were three of us. We were the first staff. I was the director and after that, as the teachers came through, we found other staff members out of that group. We just grew like Topsy. Marilyn Beckwith was particularly a help to me because she was on the staff as well as a founder when I came on board in 1982. And I've never known anyone who loved to talk about the teaching of reading more than Marilyn does. It's just a topic that is near and dear to her heart. Of course, Kay Allen's wonderful following in those footsteps. She had the wonderful demeanor and personality and, and ability to carry on. We had a fabulous person on staff, Suzanne Carricker, who could write curriculum the way that uh, other people sit down and have a conversation. If she knew that a teacher or a set of teachers needed a particular curriculum written, she was able to develop it. Not only has our curriculum been updated through research, additional curriculums were developed by Suzanne. The teachers who were learning the Nyehouse Center methods were incredibly receptive. Freda Parker, one of our founding members, came into my classroom and she taught me on the job. She came every Friday and she helped me plan lessons and she would watch me teach a lesson and I learned it by doing it under her guidance. Pretty soon other teachers were coming into my room wanting to see what I was doing and they wanted that information as well. By 
1994, the Nyhaus Center was getting pressed for space. When I did the training, we were in the second floor of an office building over on Alabama. And it seemed perfect. There was parking underneath. There was room for everybody. There was room for the classes. There was room for the staff. And all of a sudden, we started, it seemed like it was getting tighter and tighter and tighter. I think that as we began to grow, we felt like it would be better if we could have a permanent location that we owned. A committee was formed to search for a new home. There were about four ladies that were with me that would go around and we probably saw maybe, I probably looked at 30 buildings, probably we went to see 10 or so. We went out on lots of days, tromping around commercial real estate, places in all parts of town. There were some that I thought, wow, this is gonna need a lot of work. The interesting thing is we saw a building on this very site and it was so bad that one of the ladies, Freda Parker, could not go in the building, it was so moldy. And uh, the old man had this building he was so proud of, but it was leaking like a sieve. And as a result of an auction, we bought the building and the ground, and then we started the building. And to design it so that it would last for a really long time. And there have been times over the years when we have thought, this building isn't big enough for what we need to do and we've been able to reconfigure it to make it work. So it's just, it really is pretty amazing how this building has served us. All of the growth came with generous funding and key foundation support. We're so lucky to be in Houston. This is one of the great philanthropic cities in America. I think the support was a mix. Certainly the foundations played a big part because they had a good amount of money to contribute, but it was broad-based. It was a broad-based support. A lot of individuals, but some key foundations as well. And then I think of the continued support of folks like the Farish Fund, the Brown Foundation, Houston Endowment, the Houston Livestock and Rodeo. All of them recognize the importance and want to give back to their community. But it's also unique in the sense that we have so much support from our community, as well as our board. One big infusion into the operating budget was thanks to the annual luncheon. It's been very exciting who we've been able to attract. The luncheons are very well attended. In that first luncheon, when Barbara Bush spoke, it was a sellout and there was even a room with a video camera. They just didn't get to see her in person, but they had an overflow room. The first time I attended the luncheon, I was honestly blown away because we have on average 900 people that attend our luncheon annually. It is amazing and it's very much reflective of the great work we do here and the number of families and people that we have impacted in the community. It was a wonderful way for it to, to display what we had to offer and it's continuing. What makes us different? We've been part of the growth and awareness of dyslexia and instrumental in providing solutions by making research an important part of Nyhouse. In terms of what sets us apart, number one, it is the team who serves at Nyhouse. I'm so proud of our team. They are the most committed, passionate individuals you can find who believe in the given right of literacy for all. I do think that one thing that makes us different is research. And they have been concentrating on research at Nye House for years. I think sometimes it's fortunate and the stars align. And from the beginning, Nye House has been about this committed group of people who wanted to do the right thing for all children. Nye House CEOs, board, and staff have been very forward thinking by staying involved and in taking leadership positions with state and national organizations. What really gave us a tremendous amount of force and pushed us forward was the 1986 dyslexia legislation where every public school teacher was to know about dyslexia and to understand what to do with a dyslexic child in their classrooms. There's a huge difference in terms of knowledge of dyslexia. It's a term that is used and uh, wasn't used in the early days. It's a huge accomplishment. Lennox has been very instrumental in the state of Texas as well as the International Dyslexia Association with moving awareness forward, moving research forward, as has Dr. Suzanne Carriker. Nyhouse's work with school districts not only around Houston, 
but across Texas and beyond. I would say this center was on the leading edge of using distance learning or teleconferencing. They had a school district down in Brownsville that they taught every week from here, and it was really effective. We do work with Mississippi. They recently passed legislation regarding dyslexia. Still do a lot of work in Idaho. We work with something like 70 school districts in Texas, but also as far away as Nokomis, California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, so we actually work all over the country. The other partner I should really highlight is our university partners are so important to us because what they end up doing is creating leaders of literacy, if you will. We've created an updated curricula, which is informed by research, to provide teachers with effective best practice strategies for teaching literacy skills. In the mid to late 90s, we hired a full-time researcher. We thought it was important for us to keep up with all the research that was coming out from other places, but also to be kind of checking in ways that we could our own work and work product. Research has really advanced our understanding of dyslexia, and it really is a difficulty in detecting the sounds and spoken words. If students can't detect the sounds and spoken words, then they won't be able to match sounds to symbols. So it's really science and research that have informed the way in which we teach students with dyslexia. And what we're finding is that all students benefit from the same instruction. We are always trying to stay up to date with the research. So as new research comes along, we want to embed that into what we're teaching. So by writing our own curriculum, we're able to change it whenever we need to based on what research is saying. Over the years, we've expanded our mission to provide professional development to all literacy teachers by offering an online and in-house catalog of classes for preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school reading teachers as well as classes for teachers of struggling and dyslexic readers. Over and over, we would hear from teachers, I am so glad I took this course. I, for years, I have not been able to reach those struggling readers. So that's what we're about. That's what we're trying to do, is reach those teachers so that they know what to do in the classroom or to refer the children to some specialist who will give them more intensive help. How do we know what we do is effective? From evidence-based outside research involving our curricula, plus our own research. But the best evidence often comes from the teachers themselves. We always say that we don't have to do much marketing because the teachers do it for us. And many teachers will come for just a workshop that's a day, and they'll come back for another and another and another. So what does the future hold, and how can we be even better? It's our mission to continue to reach as many people as we can, and technology, as I mentioned, will be a high part of that. The future is bright, and the debate's been, should we go and build another center somewhere? I think what we've learned is we don't need to do that, that we can use technology to help expand what we already know and, and have offshoots of the center through telecommunication, if you will, distant learning as we call it. If you expand this building, maybe you can handle about uh, maybe a couple hundred people over the year, but if you spent that money on technology and you didn't expand the building, you'd be able to reach thousands of people, so I think that's the way to go. What I would like to see happening in Nye House moving forward is to have a profound effect on how teachers are prepared to deliver first instruction in reading so that they have the knowledge, the skills, and the tools, and most importantly, the ability to apply the use of those tools in every classroom, any day that they're teaching. For decades, the people of the Nyhouse Education Center have fed off the feeling of success, the feeling that we are making a difference. Because a dyslexic student is very bright, they know that the others are reading differently than they are. And when we 
get with them and tell them they have a learning difference, that they learn differently and they just haven't been taught in the way that they learn. The relief that you see is just tremendous. I remember uh, a student I had, her name was Jenny. She came uh, to me when she was in second grade. I remember one day, and it probably was the breakthrough moment, she was trying to read the word cheap, C-H-E-A-P, and she was sounding out every single letter. And I showed her that the E and the A go together to make one sound. And she just stopped, looked at the word, and then she said, you mean those two letters together make one sound? She was just excited to read. Reading is so important to a good life. It's the first thing that a child in school needs to learn to do. A person who can read can transport him or herself to different worlds and I want everybody to be able to do that. I think our parents would be amazed and proud and sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing what, uh, what's happened. Yeah, it's way beyond their wildest dreams. They didn't realize it would be this big. Whether it was staff, whether it was board members, whether it was teachers in the classes. So I guess I'm just proud of the fact that the center attracts this amazing group of people to, to really do good work.